Ezekiel 39 and the cleansing of the land. Now remember, Ezekiel 38 is not talking about Armageddon. Ezekiel 38 is talking about the war at the end of all time, a thousand years from now. But if Ezekiel 39 is talking about Armageddon. And we have some really interesting insights into what's going to happen on the other side. And I kind of like to walk through some of this. And again, it's highly interesting to me for other reasons, but um, mainly because I might want to be a garbage man in that area. Um, Ezekiel 39.9 Then those who live in the towns of Israel will go out and use the weapons for fuel and burn them up, the small and large shields, the bows and arrows, the war clubs and spears. For seven years they will use them for fuel. The word fuel is not really the word that's there. Um, it just says fire. But verse 10 kind of gives us an idea of why it's our Bibles translate this as fuel. Um, Ezekiel 39 10, they will not need to gather wood from the fields or cut it from the forest because they will use the weapons for fuel. Uh, again, weapons for fire. And they will plunder those who plundered them and loot those who looted them, declares the sovereign Lord. There's a lot of information in this. One, I don't know that we're going to go back to living 2,000 years ago, although we certainly will during the Exodus. You know, we've grown up with electricity, and all the means for having electricity are going to be there in the kingdom, so I certainly think we would be doing that. However, when we're saying you don't need to heat your home because you've got this, all these weapons out there, and you're going to use it for seven years, certainly... In the time when Ezekiel wrote this, he was aware that they used metal for the weapons. I mean, even Daniel talks, you know, as they go through the armor and everything, they've talked about metal. They certainly weren't just using wood sticks. Again, we have the Messiah is returning with an iron scepter. So they're fully aware that weapons are made from metal. Now, if you think about it, you could say, well, is metal really used as fuel? And the answer to that is absolutely. It's a new technology that's coming out. And while I say new, it's been around since World War II or before. It was one of the major weapons in World War II. They would use thermite. Now, if you've seen Mythbusters, you've seen thermite. It's just iron powder with aluminum powder. And once it starts burning, you're not going to stop it. Um, but metal, when it is in a powder form, when it is small enough to be a powder, it is highly flammable. Um, aluminum, by its very nature, is flammable. And if you doubt that, check any video out from the United States Navy. Because the Navy ships, are most of them are made out of aluminum. Um, and the sailors that are on the Navy ships, I know... You know, um, I was doing Navy option there, training us to say, you know, you so you throw sand on a ship fire, aluminum. If your ship is aluminum and it catches on fire, you throw sand on it. And you could think, well, what good is sand? Well, sand when you throw it on top of fire that is an aluminum fire, because the fire is so hot, you're not going to be able to stop anything. So the only thing you can really do is stop the oxygen to it. And you do that by throwing sand on it, and the fire is so hot, it turns the sand into glass. And the glass um, cuts off the oxygen, so the fire goes out on the, the aluminum. That's the only shot you've got, because otherwise, it's just going to keep burning. That's what aluminum, once aluminum catches on fire, it's over. Well, we have all these weapons, and you don't think that we're going to have missiles being shot at us. And again, they're not going to hit us, they're just going to be fired and fail. And and tanks and all these other things, tons and tons, literally tons and tons, millions of tons of, of metal is going to be sitting around Armageddon. We get to actually use that as fuel. And again, how you do that, it's very simple. If you, especially if you have a coal fire plant or power plant, you just grind that aluminum and steel up into powder and it just, you know, how they do coal in a fire, in a power plant is they just shoot it in from the top. It's also like um, sand size or dust, and it just 
trickles down and catches on fire and heats the air and that goes to the boilers. Um, it's a very common thing, it's no big deal, but we're going to have that for fuel for seven years. We know that because he tells us that. So if he tells us that's going to happen, then that's going to happen. Um, let's go back to Ezekiel 39.11. Um, well, actually, while I'm still in 39.10, we will plunder those who plunder, who plunder them and loot those who looted them. Um, Israel's going to be attacked um, right before we leave on the Exodus. All those countries that send troops will be looted. So I believe that those countries will include Russia, China, India, Turkey, and I'm sure some others. But you can kind of see things forming up of who will join in with that army. Um, we don't have to worry about Syria. Syria will be part of them, but Syria won't be anymore at the end of the Exodus. By Armageddon, Syria doesn't exist. At Armageddon, in case Jordan joins with them, at Armageddon, Jordan doesn't exist. Um, and for the most part, neither does Iraq. So even if Iraq were to join, it wouldn't really matter. Um, Iran may join. And so any of those countries that join in the battle to come after Israel will be looted by us afterwards. Now that doesn't mean we go get them. We've defeated the entire army and basically it's a surrender issue. And we pay you because we've lost. Um, now, it doesn't mean we get the money. That should... Pr I, and it doesn't say, so I can't add. It may go to us. It probably goes just to the Messiah. Who cares? It's not, you know, we're fine either way. It's just there. It's a prophecy. It will happen. How it's, how the details are done, that's for the Creator to figure out. Um, again, we're given more than enough. And that's the easiest way of saying it. Uh, going back to Ezekiel 39 and 11. On that day I will give Gog a burial place in Israel in the valley of those who travel east of the sea. East of the sea, Sea of Galilee, um, it could be Sea of Dead, the Dead Sea, but either way it's one of those two seas and it would be the east of that. So it's either going to be in Syria or Jordan for this burial place. Um, we don't know which, uh, could be either, depends on which way they're heading out as they go east as they try to flee. Um, it will block the way of the travelers because Gog and his, all of his hordes will be buried there. So it will be called the Valley of Haman Gog. So we know it will be named at that point in time. <coughs> I gotta start doing, stop doing videos after I eat. Ezekiel 39 12, for seven months the Israelites will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. So Again, we don't want to have a priest stepping over a dead body because then he becomes unclean. We know that from Torah, so we have to cleanse the land. Now, verse 13, all the people of the land will bury them, and the day I display my glory will be a memorable day for them, declares the Sovereign Lord. Ezekiel 39, 14, I will bet you that your Bible has this mistranslated. Set apart people will continually be employed in cleansing the land. They will spread out across the land and along with others, they will bury any bodies that are lying on the ground. After seven months, they will carry out a more detailed search. So it's seven months just for them to find the bodies that are out there. That's how many bodies there are as they are what the only way we could really describe them are grave diggers. Um, they are set apart. Now any of the versions of the Bible that do actually put the word set apart in there use it in the worst way. They're set apart people because they're touching dead people. We know from the Torah that if you touch a dead person you have to go, before you can become clean, you have to do two mikvahs. You have to wait seven days and go through two mikvahs, one on the third day and one on the seventh day. So that's why they're set apart. It's not that they're set apart wholly like, you know, we should be or set apart righteous it's although they can be but again they're set apart because they're unclean during the action okay um, and so the the more detailed search will go to 15 as they go through the land anyone who sees a human bone will leave a marker besides it marker beside it under the grave and until the grave diggers bury it in the valley of Haman Gog and then 16 near a town called Hama and so they will cleanse the land. So 
there's some interesting issues in here. As they are going throughout the entire land, after they finish with the area of Gog and Magog and that entire army, and cleansing and burying all those people, do they go through and go to the cemeteries that are in the land? So let's assume that I live in Lebanon, um, in the tribe of Dan, which would be around Tripoli. And there's huge um, cemeteries in Tripoli. Do they come clean out all the old bodies too? And so that the land should only have a few burial spots for those who you know, were Israelites during the time and not these unclean people. They need to be out of the land so we can actually have the tribal land being clear. I don't know the answer to that. It doesn't say. It just says we, you know, we mark it and they come and grab the bodies and move them out. Now in Beirut, there is a um, Jewish cemetery. I would assume that that Jewish cemetery stays, but there's also Muslim cemeteries and all that. I don't want that in the area. Now, if if he doesn't give us that authority to move them, we don't get to move them. But if he gives us the authority to move those things and we're moving everybody else, I'd rather move them and not have that section of our land unclean. So, um, you can think as well, you know, they've, they put this uh, cemetery in front of <laughs> where they think the temple gate will be. So again, first thing, we use these people, they move those bodies out, you know, because we don't want to keep that thing unclean. By any stretch of that, it was done as a way to hurt us. The Creator is much stronger than that. He's got a plan. He'll take care of it. But I really, I, I don't know, but I certainly hope that all that gets cleaned up and we get to move those things out of our tribal land. You know, if a cow walks over uh, a grave site, it's not a big deal. But a priest cannot be walking over a grave site. So there's some issues there.